Okay, so uh, the first couple of questions that we have, um, I'm going to put them together and I, I have a architecture answer for the question, but then I'm going to ask Dr. Carnell and Dr. McCauley Wrench to um, please weigh in their thoughts as well. So the first question is, is there any intent to recover equipment from Apollo after 50 years of lunar surface exposure to evaluate the long-term effects of lunar environmental exposure? And then I also want to add an additional similar question was, um, is there any possibility of visiting the previous crash site of Israel's Bear Sheet mission to search for possible signs of any tardigrades that were included on board as, sci as, as a science exper experiment? Um, and sending a, and uh, they said sending a rover to search for any signs of tardigrades would be a great practice for future solar system missions whose goal is to search for signs of life. From an architecture perspective, we just want to remind everybody that the goal of this meeting is to look at the science drivers for the HAB, but that we do have and we do have sample return as a um, as a capability in the architecture. But we are um, but right now um, the architecture is designed to go to the south pole. So one of the things we want to encourage people to do is to look at um, you know the architecture um, as it comes as it comes out in the future and look to see um, um, if we. Um, Sorry, I want to make sure I get this right. To look to see um, uh, if if there's a, a high need to not go to non-polar regions. There is um, SND is currently undertaking a study to look at non-polar regions, and so we need we would need to look and see if those needs are super high enough to go the science value to go to non-polar locations. So that is something to consider in the future. And I would really love to hear from uh, Dr. McCauley Ranch and Dr. Carnell on their thoughts on those two questions as well. You want to go first, Lisa? I was talking to myself. Um, <laughs> so, um, thanks. And, and if I, if I recall, the question was about, you know, go, uh, you know, recovering equipment and then returning to, um, you know, specific areas in those missions. And, you know, it's interesting that that question is raised, whether it's in that context of the Apollo missions or where Israel landed, you know, we've been having those discussions within NASA about returning Artemis missions to the same location because we currently have plans to visit different sites. And for those of you that may not be aware, you know, it was interesting. Um, we did a, uh, we had investigators do a plant regolith study where they took um, Apollo samples from, you know, Apollo 11, 12, 17 sites and, you know, we're able to examine growing, you know, very baseline, some, some uh, Arabidopsis seeds in that, in those different regions, and they were different. And so I think one of the benefits of seeing the different locations, whether it's from the biological perspective, ISRU landing is where is helping us to identify where is the best location for us to establish, you know, a sustainable presence. So um, I see the clock counting down. I'll keep talking, but um, I'll hand that over to Becky. Uh, I'll just add that, you know, I think um, I, I don't know how much of a baseline um, knowledge we have about the potential like microbial um, uh, hitchhikers <laughs> um, or uh, or any of the organics that might have been um, on the Apollo missions. But um, that being said, I mean, there there's an opportunity there if we're going to go there anyway. Um, to look at any potential contamination um, uh, around the sites um, where the Apollo astronauts were, where their equipment was, um, and if there's been any, uh, you know, degradation. Is there anything measurable, um, you know, there now? Um, that is useful information. I don't know that I would say without the baseline information, I don't know that I would say it's a primary science driver, um, but it's definitely a mission of opportunity that could be considered. I, I would like to, to add something from a non-science perspective. Um, one is with respect to Apollo sites, there is um, uh, uh, an effort to uh, identify those as historic sites. I believe in the Artemis Accords themselves, they talk about not disturbing those. So that would go into that aspect of whether you would go there um, with respect to crashed or discarded equipment in general, there's always the legal aspects of who owns that and whether you're actually allowed to go do it. Um, that also exists. So just thought I would throw those two things out there. 
Those are all excellent answers. And thank you for your addition there, Jerry. Um, I, I think that, that that's a very, very good things to, um, to consider across the board with it uh, with this and and in reality. Uh, well, um, a thing that we would love for the community to do is to look at the architecture definition document when it comes out to see, you know, if, if, if you if agree with sample return. And again, if you agree with, you know, to have this conversation with regards to, um, you know, looking at these sample sites and to address all these issues. So we encourage the community to kind of look at that moving forward as as we start to look at that, those parts of the architecture. Um, Jerry, the next question is that's up is for you, actually. Um, it's a question from the plenary session, um, uh, the first plenary session. It is, please describe how the STMD shortfalls, especially their ranking, can best support lunar surface HAB science. So I just want to make sure that um, you might be able to talk a little bit more about that. I know you touched on it, a I think, a little bit. Yeah, ahead. I was going to say each of us um, are looking at our shortfalls um, and how does it, uh, you know, what are the highest priorities um, we have gone through a lot of effort in terms of what are the gaps that still exist and how we would address those gaps. So, so as I mentioned from an ISRU perspective, the top four um, shortfalls um, were, were um, understanding and um, uh, mining water and, and volatiles in the permanently shattered crater, um, the, uh, uh, the processing of, of lunar regolith um, and, and as I mentioned, whether it's chemical, physical, biological, um, as well as the, um, the production of propellants. So basically all how that translates to the individual basic research activities, um, we will now use those shortfalls in future solicitations um, and try to address, um, you know, the types of research uh, that's needed as a function of, of the audience that we're trying to aim towards. So um, it, it will be used, it's being used. Um, that's about as most I can tell you at the moment. Oh, thank you, excellent. Um, uh, I think we had one more good question, great question for you, Jerry, while, while I have you kind of on the hook here. Since the moon is not homogeneous, are there locations where ISRU would be easier for construction? Pretty interesting question. Yeah, I, I, it's, it, it, I, I don't think there was anything that I would say easier per se. Um, I mean, on the one hand, the polar highland regolith um, is highly um, anorthocytic, uh, you know, with only a smaller amounts of, of variations to some extent in the minerals. So, so if you had simulants, um, that were reasonably good, then I could say I could go most places in the polar region and potentially the same technique will work. Whereas, you know, somebody mentioned going to non-equatorial locations um, where creep and, and uh, certain mare might be, those would be great for, again, certain processes um, tailored to, to those resources, but not necessarily work elsewhere. So. So we, it's it's kind of like you know you go mining where the resource is and you adapt. Excellent, thank you, uh, Dr. Platts. We got a couple questions for you. Um, how's the medical community engaged in these studies? Uh, SMEs in oncology, ophthalmology, cardiology, etc. Would be critical. I think you're, you're muted. muted. Yeah, I think you're muted. I think you're muted. muted. Sorry about that. Uh, you'd think we'd know how to do this by now, right? How long was it COVID? Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not on the medical side, I'm on the research side, but I can tell you, tell you that the Human System Risk Board, which is the board that um, selects those 30 or so risks that I showed you, medical operations is part of that board. In addition, um, each risk has what we call risk custodians, and that is a team of individuals, and that team always involves at least one physician as well. So we have physicians involved with those. The, the examples that we're given here are, are really quite appropriate because some of our biggest risks involve things like cardiology, and we have specific cardiologists, uh, both internal and external, who are involved. Um, 
the ophthalmology is a great one because SANS is one of our big risks and we have our own in-house ophthalmologists and we also have externals that we have as well. So we involve both the research side as well as the medical side in all of our risk identification as well as mitigation. So I hope that answers that. It does, thank you. Dr. Carnell, a, a question for you. What is the priority for advancing plant science on the lunar surface as we consider life support and food production requirements? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, it, it has actually reached a, a much higher priority level for BPS in partnership with our colleagues in the human research program, because, you know, as we learn to grow plants, you know, in the lunar environment, it needs to be sustainable, like nutrition. And, and so, you know, we work really closely with the human research program and Steve's team so that we can grow the, the right crops in that environment. And so as far as in the ECLIS environment, vice um, plant production, you know, the, it has risen to a very high priority for us. question i've got got one more here um that i think um yeah uh, it's another one for for jerry and i think i'd love to hear from anybody else who has a thought on it um how does nasa define responsible mining is there a policy document that outlines the acceptable best practices for disruption of the lunar surface for infrastructure isru research or commercial activities um so so it's there's there's not an official document i did write a um, paper for AIAA last year that goes into um, the common attributes between terrestrial and space mining, as well as um, I would call early guidelines for how we would perform ISRU on the moon in a responsibly, responsible and uh, uh, culturally uh, sensitive way. So, so no official documents, but um, we are working with the State Department and NASA Legal Office um, through UN uh, copious uh, activities on trying to work in that direction. Excellent answer. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're running up on the time on our schedule here. So um, I want to uh, thank our uh, our wonderful uh, panel of speakers again today for their great presentations and all their answers. And uh, thank you to all of our participants for all your wonderful questions today.